What is going on in a culture where men are killing themselves at an all-time record high, and I want to talk about it, and other men are coming in and trying to undercut the conversation? The story, the personal narrative of like, nobody cares. What's underneath that? Welcome to the Authentic Man Podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness, and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking, and less stress. Creating dating lives, sex lives, and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships, and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to another episode of the Authentic Man podcast. I'm your host, David Chambers. And, you know, I'm a men's dating relationship and intimacy coach. It's good to introduce myself sometimes because especially for the new listeners. And my mission really is to help men be more connected, you know, help them create better connections in their dating lives, better connections in their relationships, better connections to themselves, their own feelings and emotions and wants and desires. Because I think what I see through my work is that one of the chronic problems that men have is that we're really disconnected from ourselves and what we want. And we get kind of in the storm of what society thinks we should be and how we should be. And that actually brings us a lot of misery but when we start to find honestly and, you know, authentically what's us and what we want and what we desire for our lives, we start to live a life that's a lot more aligned with our values. And today I am joined by Trevor Boehm. It's a really beautiful, free-flowing conversation. It's almost like just listening to two blokes who talk about men and know about men talking to each other, because that's pretty much what we do. Um, we get into the kind of paradox that men have to be with right? In the world that, you know, we can look around and see that men are, you know, the wealthiest demographic. We can see that men are at the top of most important companies, running countries and so forth, but also that men are home, home more, you know, majority of homelessness is, is men. Um, you know, majority of people committing suicide are men. Um, you know, we kind of top those charts in both ends and kind of being with the paradox of that, because it can also feel like, you know, we can feel like, as men that society kind of doesn't really care because it thinks that we're all doing really well and we run everything, but actually we're struggling. And sometimes we might feel that we can't express our struggles because no one cares or listens. And I'm here to say that I care and I listen to a lot of men's uh, struggles and pains. And you also get the same from Trevor when he, when he speaks. Um, we also talk about, you know, men's pain, the different elements of men's pain and struggles. And, you know, how we're not alone, because often we feel like we're alone in our struggles, and that's far from the truth. Um, we also talk about healthy masculinity and what it looks like and how, as men, we can kind of embody healthy masculinity and also become safer men to be around. Trevor talks about his idea about how men should be um, dangerous, but not a danger. And it's very easy for you to hear that and you know, think all sorts of things, but actually it, it's a really beautiful description and his explanation behind it is really, really profound as well. Um, and we talk about how important it is for us to kind of, as men to help each other, you know, as an example, you see women's, the women's movement and you see, you know, if any of you are on Instagram or, you know, any women that are coaches, women really come together and support each other. And we talks about why actually that's really lacking for men. We don't support each other in the ways that we, we should. And if you enjoy this episode, please pass it on to someone, you know, in the most kind and loving way it is that you can help someone else is by sharing information with them that's going to aid them in what they're dealing with. So feel free to do that. Without further ado, I'll let you get into the episode. Hello, people. So I've got another wonderful guest, a man who knows men very, very, very well. I've been following him for a while. 
And he has a wonderful personality. And we've been laughing hilariously for the last few minutes <laughs> as soon as we jumped on. Um, I welcome to you and say hello to uh, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me on. Hey, how are you doing? Quite well. Uh, yeah. I'm ready to rock and roll. I, I just put a, you said like, I know men. Um, I just put a video up on Instagram saying that. And a bunch of people were giving me shit for it. And I was like, what, what is going on in a culture where men are killing themselves at an all-time record high and I want to talk about it and other men are coming in and trying to undercut the conversation? Yes. It is a, uh, it is a curiosity to me how we don't really care about our own team. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. One of the questions I have is about exactly that, actually. Well, not exactly that, but about, definitely about the killing themselves part. But before we dive in, I'd love you to introduce yourself to listeners, like who you are and what magic you bring to the world. Mm, sure, sure. Yeah. My name is Trevor Bohm. Uh, I'm an author. I've written two books. The first is called Today I Rise, which was a book about divorce and heartbreak and how you get through it and how you actually use it to benefit your life. Because uh, I had to go through it and made the decision early on with some guidance that I didn't want it to be my um, like the most important thing in my life, like the pivotal moment, but I wanted it to be the pivotal moment. I wanted to use it as an opportunity to go back through my life and go, huh, what do I want to change? What's been there that I haven't addressed? What have I avoided? What have I not looked at? What are the things I kind of know I should look at, but I haven't wanted to or haven't had time? And so I put that book out into the world. And oddly enough, a bunch of men reached out to me, hundreds of men, at a time when that wasn't my gig, right? Um, I was in between professions as a gym owner and an acupuncturist into what I do now. Uh, and I had just so many men reach out, David, and say, like, hey, this idea is intriguing to me. Would you mind like telling me more? And so it was an odd period of my life. I got on the phone with probably 300 men in a year, just randomly. Like if you wow. emailed me or like, hey, I like your book, I'd write back and be like, thanks, what's your phone number? Which is an odd situation. But then I just started rapping with dudes who were like, yeah, this is what I find to be a struggle. This is what's hard. This is what I don't understand. And I kept hearing the same thing and hearing patterns. Mm. And so I took those patterns and took those ideas and put them into a second book called Man Uncivilized. And the premise of it was that the way the civilized world, the unconscious world, directed men, directed us into very unhealthy places and very toxic mm -hmm. places and very destructive places, both to ourselves and to other men, to women, to children, to the earth. It just seemed like I, I got to, for whatever reason, see the formula. Like, hey, if you follow along the way you're, quote, supposed to, you will end up in prison, on drugs, diabetic, divorced, heartbroken, uninspired, suicidal, murderous, like broken down, depressed, anxious, you name it. And I was like, this doesn't seem to work well. So I proposed an idea of men going a different way and just threw that book out into the world and my life changed radically when men found it and then found me and started asking, okay, this is, this is actually what I've been looking for. I haven't wanted to go the far left way, which was, you know, like become a, you know, and I don't have anything against vegan feminist poets, but like that direction of like, this is the only way to be a man is to essentially be a 190 pound hairy woman. Or the second alternative was like, be Rambo. Be like, I just want to be a Navy SEAL, even though I'm 46 and I'm at, I don't, I don't want to do that. But it seemed like you, option A or option B or the middle ground was be nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I said, what if we took a little bit from both sides and brought it together and let men really pick and choose, but gave men every option, like gave men the full spectrum mm -hmm. where if you consciously want to be as feminine and light and artistic and whatever, and I'm using very general terms here, if that's how you want to live, beautiful brother, go do that. And if you want to go more loner, Marlboro Manny, classic like race cars and guns and boobs. And you can go do that too. And that's okay. As long as you've actually made the choice yourself. Mm. And what I found was most men wanted a little of both, right? Like I wake up in the morning and I meditate and I journal and then I go to jujitsu 
and then I try like valiantly to choke people. Then I mostly get choked and then I come home and I'm in relationship and I want to have a healthy relationship and I want to have a, a conscious relationship. Then I want to go out in the world and fuck some shit up again. And I want to come home and play with my dog. And, you know, I want to have this mix. And so proposing that as being uncivilized as opposed to civilized really grabbed a lot of men. And so I think the magic that I bring to the world is speaking directly to men in ways that they probably haven't heard before. Mm, Beautiful. Mm, Long answer to a short question. No, it's a beautiful answer. And it's just range, isn't it? It's bringing range. You know, this is something, you know, I see with men is that they, they are so locked in like how they have to be as a man that they, they're kind of in a, they're in this kind of invisible prison and, you know, with a glass ceiling and glass walls and they can see the other ways of being. And they're like, well, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not supposed to do that because men aren't meant to be like that. And then they find themselves dissatisfied, unhappy, frustrated in this really tiny box that's really of their own making, that's really made up in their own minds. Yeah. It's their own making. And we, I want to give them some, some hell or some grace, let's call it, and say there is a lot of societal influence or geographic influence or familial influence, community influence. Like you grew up in a, in a different part of the world than I did. So what means to be a man to you may be very different than it does mean to me, even with that invisibility. But, but you made a great point that if we ask men to just step through like, are those prison bars real? A lot of men will go like, holy shit, they weren't. But what's unfortunate, David, a lot of men will be like, they're as real as can be. Mm. And I'm like, cool, here's the key. The key is just to read and, and think and talk to other men. And they'll just take the keys and throw them behind them and be like, no, I'm stuck here. I can't mm. do anything about it. Yeah. Right. And so that's, that's the, like the inertia that we're trying to, to really wake men up to. And a lot of it happens just like this in conversation and, and, and the challenging question of, is that true? Right. Are Mm. you not allowed to be sensitive as a man? Are you not allowed? What do the sensitivity police come? And they're like, Hey man, uh, is that a tear rolling down your cheek? I think you need to come with us and go to like toughen up camp. Right. Or guys who are perhaps more emotional, like, Hey, are you not allowed to be physical? Are you not allowed to be powerful? Are you not allowed to be strong? Who says? So the whole whole premise was like challenge the rules. Don't have to go break them. We're not looking for anarchy, but challenge them. Ask yourself, is this how I want to live as a man? Mm. And if not, who's stopping you? Yeah. Right. And how my, do you, my, you know how the guy who this is such a, a a quick story, but it's it beautifully illustrated. I had a client six seven years ago who was struggling in his marriage and struggling with where he was at in his profession and and just who he was. He hadn't really worked through a lot of his childhood stuff or some of the trauma of of being in the military. And I told him, take out a post-it note and write the word permission on it, right? Like so simple. This is like coaching, not even coaching 101. This is like kindergarten coaching, right? (laughs) And that man still has that post-it note with permission in his wallet. And I know that because he's now the president of my company. Wow. 6 years later, he's now teaching workshops. He's now leading men. He's now out of his job, happily, healthily married, like working through his stuff. Are all his troubles gone? No. Right? This is a veteran. This is a police officer. He's still got some shit to deal with, as we all do. But he's now at least conscious of how he wants to exist in the world. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. If my girlfriend, I have to tell her about that little slip because she's always talking about with her clients um, permission slip. She's like, I'm giving, and she says it to her clients. I'm giving you a permission slip to go and be you. I'm giving you a permission slip to ask for what you want. I'm giving you a permission slip to go and have the fun and joy that you want. Because often even the imaginary permission slip there is enough because we didn't, we don't realize that, as you said, the bars, they're not real. They're just invisible. And we've just imagined them to be in the way, or we think that society, there is that, you know, the feelings police or the judgment police are going to come along and lock us up. If yeah. we like, we allow other, other people judge us, it's going to be the worst thing. But actually when we step out of it and we go, Oh, I just stepped into a position where I've, I've worn, I don't know, a pink shirt and someone over there looked at me and I might've judged me. Oh, but that doesn't do anything to my life. I can still walk down the street perfectly safely and happily. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it, that's that's it in a nutshell. Just just challenge the belief. 
mm-hmm. right? Question of, of, and then do I even care what this person's perception is of me? Right. One of the guys I teach with, if you know Dewey Freeman, uh, is this genius, genius therapist. And I don't use that word lightly. He's in his 70s. He's created institutes, yada, yada, yada. He always tells this story of being in Australia and using the word, like teaching uh, horsemanship, you know, to a bunch of a co-ed workshop and saying like, you know, get your fanny back on the on the saddle. And having everybody like giggle and kind of, and he said the word like five or six times until finally one of the co-teachers pulled him aside and said, hey, here fanny is the word for pussy. And he he, he didn't know. And he, you know, he's American to us, like fanny's your butt, like get your butt back, right? He's like, well, what do you guys call fanny packs? And I'm telling you that story because people will say things to you and I as men that it's almost like it's a second, it's a foreign language. I don't care if you don't like my pink shirt. It's it's literally like you're you're like giggling at me in Chinese. I don't I don't even know what the words mean. I don't give a fuck, right? My my I have a bigger purpose and a bigger passion and a, a direction in life that feeds my heart and soul. And you can't compete with that with like snickering at my shirt or the fact that I cried last night watching a movie or that I'm not quote a real man because I don't like have some arbitrary thing like eating bacon or loving Jesus or, you know, do it hunting, whatever it is that you particularly have chosen to call me quote, a real man. Uh, it's yeah, it just bounces right off. And I hope guys listening to this specifically go when you're comfortable in your own body, you're bulletproof. I don't give a fuck what people think about me and my work at this stage. Right. I can, I can, um, and this goes both ways, David, I'll tell you uh, another fun story. Like two months ago, I had a woman actually send me a picture of a tattoo where she had taken the, the, the title of my book today I rise. And then the mantra of the book is one day stronger. And she'd gotten both of those tattooed on her forum Mm -hmm. today. I rise one day stronger. And I was like, Holy shit. And then an hour later, Someone on Instagram, literally an hour later, someone sends me a message saying, you are a complete and utter dumbass. I can't believe that you like that people follow you, people read your work, et cetera. And, and I had to take each one of those with the same grain of salt, right? I'm like, yes, I'm appreciative that you like my work. Yes, I really don't give a shit that you don't like my work. Uh, I know who I am. I know what I'm about. I know what I'm doing as a man. Yes. Yes. And I'm going to r- turn back to something you said earlier, actually, about sure. suicide. And, you know, we're in this era now. It's a weird era of, of humanity, I think, where, you know, we all look at all the positions of power and we see men, right? We see men across mm-hmm. the world and, you know, a few dotted around, there's a few women. But we also see men, like, killing themselves in record numbers, right? Yeah. And then we see men at the top of companies and the top of wealth charts and so forth. But then we also see boys um, yeah. and men being lonelier than they ever have before or boys struggling in school in ways that, you know, have, have never been before. And yeah. it's this real kind of polarity, dichotomy, you know, whatever words you want to use. But there's right. also men feeling that like they're the victim of society, right? And they're kind of right. pointing the fingers at women in particular often or other, other marginalized groups as well, sometimes as well. Like, what's your right. kind of thoughts on this about where this is kind of coming from within within those men? It's confusing, David, right? There's a lot of confusing messaging going on out there. You're right. The top 1% of 1% of wealth and power, et cetera, is held by men. And we can't argue that, It's it's or it's hard to argue that. And, and I don't know the exact statistics, so I'm going to make something up. Like the bottom 20% is also held by men. And the middle, the big middle or the lower middle is also held by men, right? Statistics are now coming out so clearly. Guys like Richard Reeves, guys like uh, the Tin Men on Instagram. Richard Reeves just wrote of boys and men. He is a brilliant scholar. Like this guy is an academic. This isn't a philosophical book, right? This is a statistician who spent his life He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Like this is not John Smith from, you know, 7-Eleven. This is a dude who's like the top of his field. 
and is pointing out all the ways that men and boys are struggling in society. Those are facts. Now, the challenge is men feel those facts. Like we intuitively, I think, know this, right? I know, I just had a, fail, a male family member three weeks ago commit suicide. Like I can, I can feel that and then turn and go to social media and gear, wow, male privilege, toxic masculinity, men run the world, fuck men, all men are trash, men have no feelings. And go, wait a minute, this doesn't, something's not, something's not right here. Now, what, we're tr- what I'm trying to do is create the through line, the message that breaks through both of those mm-hmm. and says, hey, if you're struggling, I want you to know I see you, I feel you, I get you. And society's not going to celebrate you for picking yourself up, dusting yourself off, asking for help, seeking that help, and it may not even be there culturally or societally, right? We don't really help a lot of men but there are organizations that do and you actually breaking through that and getting the help you need, getting, working with a therapist, working with depression, working with anxiety, working with your health challenges, working with your body dysmorphia or whatever it is that you're dealing with, working with the shame you have, working with the guilt you have, right? So I want men to go, huh, I get it. Uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are men and they make a fuck ton of money, like biblical fuck ton of money. And I have trouble paying my rent this month. And I have two kids. And I have an ex-wife who wants alimony. And my mom is sick and I have to help pay for her medical stuff. And I'm just, this isn't me, but I'm saying this. Like, that's real. Mm. And Jeff Bezos, the fact that Bezos and Elon have dicks doesn't make it easier for me to, to be in my situation. Because I too have one and therefore I should, because of the patriarchy or whatever we want to call it, be up there with them. So I I hope this makes sense that I understand the confusion for a lot of men. And my my, my buddy, uh, another co-teacher, Michael Gay, said this really well on a call a couple of weeks ago, that so many men's personal situations are opposite of the narrative. And yet the narrative lives on. And yet, so those men feel even more devalued. Those men feel even more invisible. Those men feel even more marginalized. And and I know when using the word marginalized with men is not popular, but if we look at every fucking statistic, we're we're not doing well, right? And and then no one's like really coming to the rescue of, there's not going to be a march through DC this weekend of both men and women be like, men die 10 years earlier than women. We need to solve this. They're like, well, that's your fault, right? It seems to be the way that if men are doing well, it's because of the patriarchy. If men are struggling, it's because of their own shit, Mm. right? So you're, it's like your fault either way. Mm. So what we need to do is ask men to step out of both systems and say, okay, guess what? I'm going to turn social media off. I'm going to turn media off. I'm actually going to figure out what I need to do right now. What is my next best step? If I'm struggling with my weight, my next step is to go for a walk. If I'm struggling with my finances, my my next step is to join a Facebook group on personal finances or to look at my business or to get some of my buddies together, right? And say, hey guys, let's break some bread this weekend. Let's have dinner. I want to know what's working in your businesses, what's working in your business, what's working in yours, because mine's kind of struggling, right? We need to invite each other back into each other's lives. I had, I had five guys over for dinner the other night, David, and I knew three of them. I just reached out to five dudes and was like, hey, I want to ask one single question. How do we make sure that men are emotionally and spiritually okay with the speed of technology? I'm kind of a man dork. So would you guys mind if we just chewed on that question all night? And by the way, I'll make chili. You know, it wasn't like a seven course. (laughs) There will be meat. There will be beans. (laughs) There will be chili powder, paprika, and rice, and some chocolate chip cookies. You guys good? Right? (laughs) And And I'm saying this because a little bit of initiative goes a long way. Yes. Right. So that's where I want men to really, to to not like it's, you don't have to take on the world right now, but look at your situation and be really honest. Are you depressed? 
Okay, then reach out to some mental health services. Are you depressed because you feel alone? Okay, then then do the hard thing and go join a group. Go join Toastmasters. Go to the Rotary Club. Go join the Jiu-Jitsu gym. Oh, you don't have any money. Okay, get a second job. Look at where you're like, you know what I mean? Like take some real radical responsibility without beating yourself up. I think that's the thing that we definitely need to add because a lot of guys are like, I'm broke because I'm useless. Mm -hmm. I'm fat because I'm lazy. I'm depressed because I'm a piece of shit. Or I want to say, no, 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 no. There's a lot of external forces on you, especially coming out of three years of whatever we want to call the fuckery of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Most men that I talk to, David, and it doesn't matter if they make $10 million a year or $10 an hour, most men are exhausted right now. Yeah. yeah. They're just like, I'm fucking tired, man. Right. And then I'm not saying that women aren't equally tired. I'm just saying sp- women are equally tired, if not more. But talking to men, we're tired. Guys got beat up. Guys watched their loved ones get die. Guys couldn't go see people in the hospital. Guys couldn't be there for the birth of their children. Guys didn't go to the office anymore where they did have camaraderie, where they did get to shoot the shit around the water cooler, where they did get to go to lunch with people. Guys didn't get to do their thing. And we're still like, well, you guys created the patriarchy, so fuck you. You know, like, go go pay your rent with your privilege or whatever we want to call it. Mm-hmm. And, and the guy's like, well, wait a minute. But I'm not I'm not doing well. Somebody help me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's, is that, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Because like, what I really hear in there is like, <clears throat> and I preach this a lot with, with in my work and with my clients, is personal responsibility. Like, there is a societal um, structure, right? of the patriarchy, but if you want to take personal responsibility for the, how your life is, right. That's when you have power, right. You start taking personal responsibility for like, this is how my life is. It's not how I want it to be, but also not internalizing your circumstances into like internal shame that you're kind of direct hatred and shame towards yourself, because that's a really optional part of it. When we take personal responsibility, we can start to make a difference and change in our life. And that might be reaching out to friends and family, a coach, or, you know, a men's group and all sorts of things like that, that allows us to shift gear out of where we are, because there is a lot of help out there for men, right? But it's whether it gets yeah. accessed in the same way. Like, I, I always tell this joke, like my, my girlfriend's a, a coach as well, and she works with women, right? And I work with men. And the way that women come to her, they're like, I have a problem and this is, I need help with this, right? Men kind of roll up in my DMs and on Instagram and they'll be like, hey, I like your post and you're like, okay. They're like, and then you kind of have to dig around and then you're like, so what's, what's going on for you? And then they start telling you. And it's only when I get them on a phone call. And this is something I find remarkable, right? And it's really beautiful. Guys get on a phone call with me and I just tell them that this is a safe space to speak, that I've heard all sorts of crazy shit from people. Right. And I don't judge anybody because I've done some fucked up shit in my life and I know how we get in fucked up situations. And at that point, right, most men will talk continuously from anything from 15 minutes to an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, because someone's just said to them, hey, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to your problems and I'm going to judge you. I'm not going to say that you're privileged or whatever it may be. I'm just going to listen to you because I get it, man. Life's hard. And that first like release for them is often the first time they've ever had anyone really listen to them. These are even including guys who are in partnerships or in relationships where they've been able yes, to sir. talk and not be interrupted or told they're wrong mm. or in any way and just had a space for them to speak. And that often is the first stage to change is actually just saying like, hey, this is what's going on for me and finding someone mm. who will listen. And there's a lot more people in our lives that will listen than we think. Oh, that's thank you for saying that. The societal message here, at least in the in the West, in the US, is that like men need to speak up, men need to say, men need to say. And so many of us have said, we have been saying it, but no one really listens. Right. I share I shared this this morning um on on Instagram. I was I led a workshop. It was like a corporate gig. So I it wasn't guys who had paid to be there. Someone was like, hey, go down to the cafeteria. There's some dudes here who are gonna talk to you. And uh, we had about 90 guys show up, David. And this is more blue collar. It was a, uh, a steel steel mill. Mm-hmm. So not guys who are used to coaching, not guys who are used to this kind of work. And first thing we did, sit them down and say, okay, close your eyes. Raise your hand 
if you honestly think no one gives a shit about you or your problems as a man, wow. raise your hand, keep your eyes closed. And about 80% of the hands went up. Wow. 80%. We were shocked. Now here's this. I just got chills, man. Here's part two. A hundred percent of the guys 35 and under had their hands up. Mm -hmm. All of them. I wow. thought it would be the opposite. Yeah. I thought it'd be the old grizzled, you know, guys who in their sixties, like no one fucking cares about me. It was the young guys. And then here's what we asked next said, okay, cool. And these were guys, David, who'd, some of them were, it only been the company for like three months. Some of them had been there for 30 years, like third generation. He said, okay, raise your hand. Now, if you would take a call from any man in this room at 2 a.m., if it was like a 911, I'm in trouble call. Mm. And every single hand went up. Mm. So I said, guys, open your eyes right now. Look around the room. 80% of you had your hands up saying that no one cared about you. Look, every single hand is saying that they actually do. So we also have to embrace the fact as men that there is help a foot in front of us. And we have a story that says like, nobody cares. Mm. Nobody gives a shit. I am hell bent this year on breaking that story. Just so those guys know, huh, I am struggling. I am in trouble. I do have somebody, just one person that I can reach out to and be like, hey man, like, I don't know if I'm doing that well today. Mm. Right. And I've made that call. I want to say this on this podcast. Like I've made that call myself. Years ago, I remember I had a mentor who was like, if you just don't know what else to do and you're like in that place, call me. Mm. And I remember David staring at the phone and being like, all the standard shit, right? Like, I don't want to bug him. What if he's busy? What if this is dumb? I should be able to handle this myself. I'm 40 years old, like blah, blah, blah. And I called him and he said, so why are you calling me? And I said, well, you just told me that if I didn't know what else to do to call you. He went, okay, have a seat. What do you got going on? Mm -hmm. Right. And 15 mm -hmm. minutes later, I, I, I was okay. Like, yeah. okay, man, I'm going to, I'm going to check on you again tomorrow. That was it. It wasn't like, here's the, here's the magic solution to all your problems. I just needed somebody to hear me. Mm -hmm. But man, that, that is a, there is a bit of a distance to go from, from knowing someone's there to actually pushing the buttons to hitting send. Right. Yeah. It's like, I don't yeah. know how old you are, but when I was, you know, a teenager and we used to call a girl, I would like, dial the seven the six digits and then hang up it's like i knew i was gonna have to like, <laughs> and the parents might pick up <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. so you do that like 14 15 times so you finally get the courage to like hit the final bummer and like hi mrs johnson is Susie there <laughs> <laughs> and mrs johnson is super nice as well she's like yeah, yeah, hey, sweet as she can be. Trevor, is Trevor, is that you <laughs> How are you? But you're yeah. like, I, I'm good. I'm good. She's like, I'll get her right away. <laughs> <laughs> Guys under 30 don't know the sheer terror of having <laughs> calling the house phone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the days, the days. <laughs> I was wondering, right? So you were saying there's this story of like nobody nobody's what nobody cares right and that this what, what do you think's underneath that because there's for some men there's going to be there's an element of truth right in that that they feel that for nobody sure. cares but there's a story you know the story the personal narrative of like nobody cares yeah like what's yeah what's underneath that because if if you're in a uh a company and then you've got like i don't know 80 guys who would all support each other so the, the yeah. support exists, the love, the care, the appreciation exists, but we're not receiving as men that actually these people care mm -hmm. or that we have a story. Like mm -hmm. what, what, what do you think the foundations of this story that we hold? I think there's two pieces to it, David. There's the societal piece, which are all these tiny micro messages mm -hmm. that like we actually don't care. Mm -hmm. And I say to guys, on some level, society doesn't care. Like our job as men is to produce. The day we stop producing, we're kind of like, nah, you can move to the side. Mm. And so they they're told in all of these messages, watching their father struggle, watching what happens in divorces around who gets custody and who doesn't get custody, looking at any time, and I use this word very loosely, there's an inequality between men and women of say you commit a crime, a woman commits a crime, you get 10x the sentence she does. 
you make a phone call and say, hey, I think I'm in an abusive relationship. Can I come into your center for resources? Like, nope, there's none of those for men. Mm. Hey, I was assaulted by a man. Is, can you guys, is there a resource? Nope, you need to go, here, here's a jujitsu brochure. Like, you need to toughen up. Uh, so there's, there's like the, all the millions of like micro messaging, right? If we're here in the U.S., we can look at, um, this is just one example, and I have no, no issues with breast cancer. But look at the NFL, our football league, and, and, it's, and it's, what does it support? Breast cancer, mm. right? How many men die of prostate cancer? Yearly, and we can look at the inequality and in funding between the two. Here, you have a sport that ninety-five percent of the audience is male, hmm. and yet, why aren't they promoting and supporting prostate cancer? So it's it's like the societal piece is there. It's in the messaging. No one really gives a shit. You're the patriarchy. You're privileged. You don't understand. You're trash. You're blah blah blah. But then there's also the personal piece, which is I bet you that every single one of those men has some kind of evidence that they did reach out and they were told to man up. They were told to toughen up. They were told to get through it. They were told like they did throw the lifeline out and it was ignored, right? They did open up to the girlfriend and then they got rejected or they got shamed for being a pussy or like not for being too sensitive. Like they got left, right? So there's, there's this mix of evidence. They don't have enough evidence on the positive side. Like when we get groups of guys together for workshops and a guy, men's workshops and a guy will say, Hey, I've never said this out loud before, but like I struggle with porn, right? To give an example. And the other 15 guys will be like, Hey, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate you saying that. Like one, now I, I know you a little better. And so I, I can trust you a little more and I, I know who you are. And two, like, from time to time, I struggle with that too. And you kind of gave me permission to actually be that. So this guy has now broken the rules and gotten celebrated for doing something that normally, if he goes out in society, he would get shamed, guilted, abused for. And so that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. But we have to combat, again, the societal message, the community message, the neighborhood message, the family message that shows no one actually really does care, right? We have to combat all of the, the wording and the messaging that's coming through that those men are picking up on or the sub-narrative. What's the thing that's going underneath the surface, right? Are we having marches in the streets because more men than women die in combat? No, we're, we don't, it's okay. We don't really care. Are we having marches in the streets because the top 10 professions that have the highest death rate are all male? No, we don't really care. You guys are good. You guys, are, you know, it's fine. But, and, but we're going to turn around and say it's toxic masculinity is why you even want to be in those professions. And if you are kind of fucked up because you came home from war and saw a bunch of really gnarly shit, or you're a law enforcement officer and you saw this, or a fireman and you saw a bunch of people burn, and now you're kind of fucked up, well, you're either one, a pussy, or two, it's toxic masculinity that put you in that job. But number three, you got to figure this out on your own. Like, I'm sorry, like you gotta be, you gotta toughen up, right? Or you are the patriarchy. So like, again, like good luck to you. You created the system. You personally, David, you're the one, like you're the dude, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm not arguing the structure. I'm just saying men need to really, we, we said it, like take ownership and say like, Hey, I'm not okay. Mm. Uh, I'm going to be the one who continues to pursue the life I want to live. If that's inner peace, I'm going to have to go outside the box, man. Right? Like I say to men, look at, look at feminism in the 70s. What did, what did women do? They got together. Yeah. And we're like, hey, this shit's not going to fly anymore. By the way, fellas, we're not doing this anymore. This isn't okay. And then look, look at what they've done with that. And whether what your thoughts are on feminism are aside, but laws were changed. Society was changed. For the better, for the worse, in some cases, again, that's to be argued. But they made change. And so now I feel like it's our time to come together and be like, hey, guys, this is on us. The suicide rate, that's not a women's problem. Addiction rate, that's not a women's problem, right? It's domestic violence, that's not a women's problem. Like, If we want to stop this stuff, it's, it's an our problem. And we get to be the solution. Here, I don't know if I've, if I've shown you this. But like, This is the uncivilized symbol. Mm. Right? For anybody right. watching, this is the symbol for male. This is half of the symbol 
for poison. Mm. This is half of the symbol for the antidote to poison. I got like 20 guys with this shit tattooed on them. Because wow. they get it. They get it. This is this is the call. We got to recognize that we can fuck shit up. We can do all kinds of damage. We all know, know men who are super damaging. And we all know men or ourselves who were damaging at one point and now have gone through a process to come out the other side and make, okay, I'm actually now going to be part of the solution. Mm. So I think that's yeah. why men are, are feeling that. One, two, or sorry, I'll stop, I'll stop rambling. <laughs> we need to give guys something to do. Mm. I, I said this during Me Too. I was screaming this during the Me Too stuff. I was like, you can't tell guys who aren't rapists to not be rapists. They just turn it out. They turn it off. Like if you can yell in my face, don't be a rapist. I'm like, I'm not. But if you say, if you're not, then I need you to come around to this side and get on the protector side. I need to give you a role to fill other than don't not be the thing that you're not already. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Like be a protector. Be one of the good guys. Don't just not be one of the bad guys. And when we give that opportunity to men, they grab it. They, we fucking love that. Oh, it's like, I'll be the designated driver. I'd love that opportunity. I'd love that role. I'll be the guy at the party that's like, hey, I've noticed you're giving that girl shots. She's not okay. We're going to make sure she gets home all right tonight. She's not going home with you. Mm. Right? That's, that's cool. That's, that's my role. Like You give men that opportunity and they take, we love it. We love it. It gives us purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true, you know, during <clears throat> a time during Me Too, which is a really uh, introspective time for myself. And I had some really frank conversations with women I knew, women I slept with in the past even. But one of the things that's often missing when we're talking to men is we don't, we say to them, stop doing X, stop doing X, right? And that's great, right? To stop people doing harmful things, but we don't give any clarity around what to do. Like for instance, the toxic masculinity, for instance, right? My I'm not a huge fan of the term, the wording, but I don't, sure. I'm not, it doesn't trigger me so much, right? But it doesn't actually say what it is, right? It's, it's, there's a vagueness to it, right? Which means it can be used for all, all manner of things, which, you know, it, it, it points to. I've come across something uh, known as the man box, for instance, uh, you know, about six months, a year ago, right? And it has these kind of very clear rules that us men are forced to live by you know, unconsciously mm. and we're bullied and mm. shamed into it. But when, and when you look at these rules, it's like dominance over women, dominance over the world, mm. not showing our feelings, mm. not crying, not talking about anything mm. deep or serious, only talking about mundane and stupid shit. When we're given those rules, there's a clarity like, okay, all right, I'm not, that doesn't help. I can kind of tick these off and go, yeah, I can see where that helps. And it's also to give men um, a bit of a framework actually, you know, well, how to move forward. So like, you know, don't shy away from vulnerability, start to create brotherhood, like real brotherhood, like you said, with your retreats. And I've been on plenty of men's retreats as well, where and I think it's a beautiful thing that I've incorporated into, into my group work that I do is when people are sharing, I ask, if you hear someone say something that resonates with you or you've experienced, just raise your hand very briefly. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's a really beautiful thing because like you said, with the, say the porn addiction, men who have sat in a circle of 20 men for the first time and they're like divulging this porn addiction that they've never told anyone. And then they see 15 other men put their hand up. They're like, wait a minute. I'd always thought that I was alone and I'm not, every other man is here. And it's like yeah. creating, you know, the direction of like brotherhood and looking after the earth, being a protector, mm -hmm. like seeing yourself beyond just what you prov we can provide for the world and seeing yourself as like valuable intrinsically for just your being. But it's only yeah. when we kind of create some kind of clarity in this for what men can do. And obviously I'll call it the, the media. They don't have any interest in that piece. They only have right. the interest in pointing out the bad stuff because obviously, you know, that's how they sell their shit. Um, right. But I'd love to know, I know we touched on some of it already, but like what are some of the things that us men can do to create not just healthier lives for ourselves, more connected lives for ourselves, but also for like our, you know, the immediate rings of people around us, like our friends, our family, our loved ones, mm. our community. Like what can we do mm. to really make shifts and changes in, in those areas? Yeah, man, it's a great question. I have an ethos, a 12 point ethos for the uncivilized. 
And the first three points of it are one, be unapologetically male. Just so let's just stop apologizing for the fact that you're a man. If society doesn't like you, that's fine. I'm, I'm not interested in civilized society, but you don't have to apologize. Own who you are. Own that your body is bigger, faster, and stronger than probably most of the planet. That's own it and then take responsibility for it. Number two, which we've talked touched a little bit, be your brother's keeper. Mm. Right? Reach out to a friend. Don't let your buddy just come over who you know is going through a divorce and is drinking too much and is, is doing some other shit and be like, hey, how you doing? And him go, I'm okay, fine. You, you want to watch football? And be like, yeah, let's throw football on. Nope. No, you know what? Like, h- how else are you besides fine? Because guess what, man? Like, I'm going to tell you this because I love you. Uh, it looks like you're struggling, you know? And I'm not saying this to judge you or shame you or put you down. I just want you to know that it doesn't look like you're being the best version of yourself. And I'd love to be there for you if I can help in any way. And oh, by the way, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep saying this. I'm not going and I'm not like disappearing tomorrow when you're like, no, I swear to God, I'm fine. As you chug your third handle of vodka and, you know, snort a line of Coke and go see a hooker. Like, I'm not going to be like, well, no, he said he was fine. So be your brother's keeper, right? And then the third one, which trips a lot of guys up, but I think when they get it, it lands super deep, is to be dangerous but not a danger. So how do you do that, right? Is this idea of like, cool, do I need a gun? Do I need to learn jujitsu? Then start lifting weights? No, you deal with your own shit. Mm. You go to the therapy that you have to go to. You join the men's group and you talk about the things that you don't want to deal with. You look at the ways that you are acting out and you are being toxic in your life. And you don't just go, okay, cool, I'm going to white knuckle that. And no, no more porn, no more cigarettes, no more Red Bull, no more this, no more cheating, no more lying. No more. You actually go, huh, I'm doing this for a reason. Let's actually look at the root of the reason. All right, let me get engaged with my own life, my trauma, my pain. This is something when we talk about permission, David societally men don't have permission to be in pain. Mm. We don't. We don't sit with men and hold them and be like, man, I can't believe that happened to you. That must have been fucking terrifying. Or that must have been awful. Right? I can't imagine having lived through what you've lived through. We don't say that to men. But after working with men for years now, there's not a single one that I've met that hasn't had something that I've gone, holy fuck, man. Like, do you realize that what you just said is like a massive deal, right? That like you lost your wife, you watched your dad beat the shit out of your mom, your sister was raped, you had a, you lost your kid, you lost your job, blah, 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 blah. Like you name it. Men have lived through all kinds of horrible stuff and most of them just have swallowed it mm-hmm. and then wonder like, why do I punch holes in the wall when my woman asked me where I was? Why do I need six beers to go to bed at night? Why am I jerking off to the internet and not getting in a real relationship? Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? To me, people who are unexplored, who are uncontemplative about their lives, they're a danger. Mm. I was a danger in my life when I hadn't looked at like, why do I do the shit that I do? And this had nothing to do with guns, jujitsu, weightlifting, et cetera. It just had to do with like, man, my wife says something or ex-wife. And then I, two minutes later, I kind of wake up and be like, holy shit, I had no idea what just happened. Sorry, I flipped the couch or flipped the kitchen table and called you the C word and, and, and yelled and like left my body. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. And then what do you know? I went to therapy. I was like, oh, okay. I know why that happened. Okay. I needed help. I need support. I needed to work through some shit. So number one, like deal with your shit, man, right? Women are, you said it, like women are great at this. Mm. Women will hire my partner, your partner, like, hey, here are the three things that I need to work on. It's like a mother wound with a little bit of it. And they have it like all sketched out. (laughs) And and you're right. Like I get dudes on the phone and I'm like, hey, it's the third week we're talking. Um, What's really going on with you? And they're like, okay, you're right. It's not, I just don't want to make more money and have abs. Like I, I have this thing that I'm it's really serious. <laughs> like, oh, this is why you hired me. Right. So I think that David is, is like, take the leadership position for yourself first. Like do an honest assessment of your life. 
honest. And this is, this is scary. Ask yourself, here's what a lot of men miss. What do I want out of my own life? Right? Do I want a family? Do I want a partner? Do I want a relationship? Do I want the business that I have? Do I want to live where I want to live? Do I like how my body looks? Do I like what I'm eating? Am I happy? Like, am I, am I doing okay? Like if I brought an auditor in, third party was like, well, you wanted to be a, you didn't want to be a lawyer, but here we are in third year of law school. Let's check a negative there. Uh, we're living in England, but we'd really love it rather live in Portugal. Okay. Let's check the unhappy box there. Like we say we want a partner, but we're masturbating seven hours a day to the internet. Hmm, let's check that. Uh, <laughs> Mom and dad left when we were three, but apparently we're fine. Okay. Let's check the unexplored box. Right? That's so many men's situations. And then there's this like kind of dumbfoundedness of like, I don't know why I'm not happy. Hmm. Man, or even satisfied, like happy may not be the right word. Or are you on purpose? Are you in do, are, do you know your own desires as a man? Mm. Mm, do you know your own needs as a man? Like I'll ask guys that question and they will just stare at me. Yep. Like I just shit on their kitchen floor or something. <laughs> like, why are you staring at me? I literally asked, like, do you know what you want? Like, and, and you know, this is the sad answer. Most of them say, well, no one's ever asked me that before. Mm. I go, cool. Now you, you understand weightlifting, don't you? You have a very atrophied, I know what I want muscle. It's there. It's just a little bit weak. So here's a two pound dumbbell. Go do 10 curls. Tomorrow, you're going to get a five pound dumbbell. A week from now, you're going to get a 10 pound. And guess what? A year from now, you're going to be crushing weights and you're going to know what you want because you just haven't explored this area. Now, you ask the question, how does that trickle out to other people? You and I both have been around men specifically who have dealt with their shit and know why they're here. They're wonderful to be around, aren't they? Yes. And they're safe to be around. Very. And if you put women around them, I've done this in workshops, like without, you know, unconsciously, we've had workshops that were co ed that, you know, six of the 12 men or eight of the 12 men have been with me for a year or two, have done a lot of work, have worked through their shit. And then at, at the end of day one, we'll have women raise their hands and say, this has been crazy. I've never felt so relaxed or safe around a group of men as I do right now. And then what's interesting, David, is I'll have men, other men outside of <clears throat> my organization or haven't done the work say, you know what? I actually feel the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So that to me is the answer to the question. Deal with your shit, figure out what you want, start living a more purposeful life. Mm. And there's a real vulnerability to all those parts, right? Because there's a vulnerability in, in holding your friend accountable to what they want. And there's a fear that comes up, right? Fear of rejection, a fear of overstepping the mark. Yeah. But there's a vulnerability of going within, right? Going inside and going, okay, what's going on in my internal world? Like, what do I want is a question I often ask my clients and they look at me, like you said, they look at me very blankly. Like they don't, as if I just ask them a question and it doesn't make any fucking sense to them. And <laughs> funny enough, the, the, they don't realize they're like, oh, well, I don't really have any needs. That's another thing men say a lot. I don't have any needs, right? Because they're self-sufficient. They don't need anything from the world, right? And it's like, well, no, you do have needs. You just never identified them. And I find that what goes along with, with not having needs is not being able to be in touch with one's emotions. Because once we start mm. having emotions and going, oh, I have emotion, like, oh, look, there is a, I don't know, a stone. There's a stone in front of me that I got from the desert. I was out there a few weeks, uh, a few weeks ago. And like, I saw the stone and I was like, I want that stone. That's a beautiful stone. But if I have no way of being in contact with my emotions, right, I would, I'll just look at the stone and go, stone. <laughs> right? <laughs> because I'll, I won't even know that I'm feeling something. So if, if, oh, I do, if you don't know what your, your needs and your wants are, you have to start being like, oh, I'm feeling something sometimes like, you know, yeah. it's, it's because you can't know what your needs and wants are if you haven't really, really felt like what it feels like to feel, right? And this is, I think it's always yeah. a really important part. And, and it is, it is remarkable that, as you said, it comes back to us. Like, you know, we can blame society for the way it is like, oh, women are against men and women all hate men and so forth. It's like, right. well, that's just how that is, right? <laughs> that's if, 
if it is like that completely. But it's like, mm-hmm. we can always come back to ourselves and start looking at ourselves and go inside to unpick the stuff. As you said, like dangerous men and men who have not processed their shit, like that they haven't dealt with the fact that their dad left when they were three years old and that their first mm-hmm. girlfriend cheated on them because what they then do is very unconsciously, they unconsciously attack other people, not necessarily physically. It might be verbally, mm-hmm. it might be mentally, it might be emotionally to kind of um, dissipate some of that anger, frustration, trauma that's kind of built up in them. But when a man does the work to start to unpick that consciously, that can be through therapy. It could be through coaching. It could be through breath work, men's work. He comes out the other side and he's lighter. He's more present. Mm. And you know, the presence piece as well, he's more present. So it means that when he's in front of a group of women, she's not experiencing him as this like rushing brain of like thoughts and, and reactions. She experiences with this kind of like, Quite, like a rock, we'll use a rock again, stone. Mm-hmm. Like they're yeah. calm, collected, which impacts her nervous system and goes, oh, I like being around this man. This feels nice. Mm-hmm. I want to be around this man some more, right? And this mm-hmm. is something that I think, you know, I try and impart on a lot of my clients and they don't always get it. It's like, you want more dates and you want to connect with women better, go inside, unpick all that stuff mm-hmm. so that when you can stand in front of people, not just women, it can be your boardroom, it could be your business partners or so forth, they feel you as a, mm-hmm. as a presence that they feel that they can trust. Mm-hmm. You nailed it. I got nothing else to say to that. Although it's, it's brilliant. It's so true, right? It's so true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and when we were around men, when we are, I feel that. I feel that in other men. I feel that. I can feel it in you in this, across a Zoom screen, across the, across the globe, right? It feels safe. Hmm. That is such an important piece. We don't give men the opportunity to say, I spent a lot of my life feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. I did. I was very small growing up. I lived in a foreign country. It it doesn't even, that doesn't matter. As a lot of us, we we weren't, you know, I'm 5'10", 190 pound ex-professional fighter at this age. At 14, I was 5'1", 98 pounds of professional nothing and was getting picked on and everybody looked giant. Everybody was big. Everybody was strong, right? The world was scary. And so I think we also, like you just nailed it. Be safe. Be safe for you so that you don't have, like I don't worry that my partner is going to say something and I'm going to throw a glass across the room or punch a hole in the wall or suddenly explode. I'm, 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 I feel safe around myself. Mm. She feels safe around me too. Like that is the best gift men could give to themselves and give to the world is just an inner, a, a, a sense of inner safety period. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thing that can really transform and heal the world is that when we bring our own sense of internal safety and that starts to radiate radiate out to the people around us and they feel it, they take on a little bit of it or they inquire why we're we're feeling that way and they want to know more Mm. and it it ripples, you know, my little stone thrown in the water ripples out and and that is how we can really make a a profound Mm. change in the world and the state it's in now. Yeah. It's the opportunity, man. Like everybody wants to look at like, how do I get a million Instagram followers so that I can change this? It's like, you trust me, you make a single shift in your life and three people next to you will make the same shift. Mm -hmm. I quit drinking eight years ago and did not, I didn't proselytize it. It wasn't like, my name's Sober Traver. This is the new, I just stopped drinking. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, I can probably name 25, 30 guys I know who have now quit drinking too. And I don't know how many of them could say, I now know 10, 15 guys that have quit drinking. And it's not any of our platforms. It's not what we preach. It's just like, I just stopped doing it. Right? You, you make a change in your life. There's an experiment for any of you guys listening. Make a positive change in your life and tell no one. See what happens three months from now. See what happens six months from now. See what happens a year from now. You don't have to say a word. And I guarantee you, someone else will go to the gym. Someone else will stop eating fast food. 
Someone else will stop looking at porn, drinking alcohol, doing drugs, having unconscious relationships, whatever it is. Someone else will follow you. I guarantee you. That is part of the essence and I think the unexplored brilliance and beauty of men is that we are natural leaders without doing anything. We don't have to have a platform. People look to us. It's a responsibility, but it's also an untapped resource. You make that change, brother, and, and someone else will make it in your life too. Mm. Yes. Amen. Amen. Ah, Trevor, it's been fantastic talking to you. And I see time is running away as it does. Um, big thank you to you, but also, you know, how can the listeners, how can they get in contact with you, work with you, come onto your programs? Beautiful. Yeah, please check out the Uncivilized podcast, or you can get a hold of my book, Man Uncivilized, on Audible, on Amazon, or from me at the manuncivilized.com website. You can go there forward slash the book and get the book. If you go to manuncivilized.com, that's where I have the nation, which is my membership group, coaching opportunities, opportunities to come to workshops, gatherings. Uh, like now that the pandemic is done, David, I'm just like getting people together. Mm. Guys, I'm like, hey, guys, you want to hop on a Zoom call? And there's like z- crickets. Like, hey, guys, you want to come sit in a park and shoot the shit? And like 50 dudes show up. <laughs> so please just go to manuncivilized.com. I'm on Instagram at Traverbohm, T R A V E R B O E H M. And if you found something useful in this podcast, please let me know, DM me, let me know, or share it with a brother in your life and tag both David and I. Mm-hmm. Amen. Definitely. I'd love to hear from the list is always a joy thank you man thanks for having me on yeah thank you trevor um thank you listeners thank you for for checking in thank you for enjoying this episode and i'd love to hear from you what you took out of this episode um and how it's going to shift your life but until next week ciao ciao